Audio recording for this meeting has begun. Okay, welcome everyone. This is our third program integrity webinar of the fiscal year, internal controls to support CCDS administration. My name is Leanne Bryan, and I'm gonna go ahead and get us kicked off, starting with some of that housekeeping. If you've been with us before, you'll recall that we do take breaks throughout our presentation for questions and answers. But at any time today, please feel free to use that chat pod at the bottom of your screen to share information, ask questions, engage in that dialogue with peers and presenters. Due to the large number of participants, we are going to keep the phone lines muted. Um, but again, we encourage dialogue in that chat pod as much as you all feel comfortable doing. The pod in the lower right corner of your screen has resources available for download, including today's slide deck. So if you want to go ahead and grab that, click if you have the ability to download and print if you would like. It is handout number seven in the resources pod. One final note here quick is closed captions. At the very top of your Adobe layout, there should be two capital C's. If you would like to use closed captioning today, all you need to do is click on those double C's, closed captioning, and you'll be able to see the words as we're presenting. On to our Nixia presenters for today. This is our small but mighty team of program integrity experts at the National Center on Subsidy Innovation and Accountability. Moving from left to right, that's me, Leanne Bryan, calling in today from Pennsylvania. Janae Broadway is joining us from her home in Louisiana. We have Shannon Masaraco, our fiscal management SME, she's from Rhode Island. And last, but definitely not least, Mike McKenzie. Mike is joining us from his home in Wisconsin. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Aidy Fator from the Office of Child Care's Division of Oversight and Accountability for a welcome message. Aidy? Yes, thank you, Leanne. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you're calling from today. It's my privilege to welcome you to today's webinar on behalf of the Office of Child Care. Um, like Leanne mentioned, I'm Aidy Fatour. I work in Office of Child Care's Oversight and Accountability Division with my colleague, who you see on the slide, Linda Wyming. Um, we're just excited to have so many of you join us today for this third webinar in our 2021 Program Integrity Series. Um, of course, this is an exciting time for child care, and we also know it's a very busy time. So we appreciate you being here and continuing to prioritize this very important work. Uh, we know that as you move forward to maximize these new funding opportunities, you're committed to ensuring the integrity of all CCDS funds. So as you know, of course, these webinars are part of OCC's ongoing work to support lead agencies to strengthen their program integrity efforts. We do really want these webinars to be an opportunity not just to present information to you, but also to provide a space for you to connect with each other, to share strategies and resources. So we definitely want to thank all of the states that have volunteered to present on these webinars over the years. We know how valuable it is to hear from those who are actually doing the work on the ground. And today we're excited to welcome the state of Georgia to share with us. So uh, the last thing I'll just say quickly is that we really do value your feedback. We use that feedback to select topics for these webinars and other TA. So please continue to share your thoughts with us. You can do that today at the, during the evaluation at the end or directly with your regional office. Let us know what you want to see more of, um, what topics you want to see us cover. Um, and if you were on the OCC webinar a couple weeks back, you probably heard there's a lot of new TA materials coming down the pike. So stay tuned for that. And with that, um, I'll just thank you again for all the work you do every day to support children, families, and the child care workforce. And I will turn it over to Leanne, Brian, to uh, review the agenda and get us started. Thanks, Leanne. Thank you, Aidy. Couldn't have said it any better myself, so I'm just going to keep us moving along. Here is our agenda for this afternoon. Mike is going to lead us off with an overview of CCDF internal controls, including some relevant regulations and sections of the CCDF plan preprint. Next, 
Shannon is going to talk us through fiscal internal controls and their importance in CCDF administration. Then we'll move to policy and process and making that link with program access and integrity. Janae will walk us through available tools to help assess internal controls, including the fraud toolkit and self-assessment instrument. Then, as Amy mentioned, we are very excited to have Woody Dover from Georgia's Department of Early Care and Learning share internal control strategies used to manage grants and contracts. As we mentioned earlier, we will have time for Q&A throughout, but also built in time at the end of the presentation today for some wrap-up and any next steps including a save the date for our final webinar in this particular series. So without further ado, I give you Mike McKenzie and an overview of CCDF internal controls. Mike? Thank you, Leanne, and thanks again to all of you for joining today's webinar. Looks like we've got uh, almost 190 folks calling in, so great numbers. We really appreciate it. Before we dive into the details of internal controls, uh, let's discuss a little bit about what they are and why they are so important to successful CCDF administration. What are internal controls? Well, the Government Accountability Office defines an internal control as a continuous built-in component of operations affected by people that provides a reasonable assurance, not absolute assurance, that an entity's objectives will be achieved. Now that's a mouthful, right? But what does it really mean for CCDF? We encourage you to use internal controls as a cornerstone of your program. Solid internal controls support development, implementation, and enforcement of policies and processes to ensure integrity and accountability while maintaining continuity of CCDF services. For federal guidance on internal controls, you can go to 45 CFR, section 98.68 sub A. Lead agencies are required to describe in their state plan their internal controls related to sound fiscal management, risk assessment, training of all staff and providers about program integrity, and regular evaluation of internal controls. Why are internal controls important to CCDF? I'll give you a couple of reasons out of this list. We have a fiduciary responsibility to make sure taxpayer dollars are spent appropriately. And a successful CCDF program helps families that need assistance attain sustainable employment and self-sufficiency. I wanted to alert you to a few of the changes in your state plan preprint for 2022 through 24 related to program integrity. While a lot of it remains the same from the last plan, there are a few provisions that I wanted to point out. 8.1.4 now asks you to describe the process you have in place to regularly evaluate your internal control activities. And 8.1.6 now asks you to identify what agency is responsible for pursuing fraud and overpayments. And just a reminder to, re to, to report the results of your fraud and recovery activities in 8.1.5 and 8.1.6. Technical assistance is all, always available. If you have questions about this, just reach out to your regional office and, and uh, we're glad to help you out. So um, that's, that's kind of the background of internal controls. Uh, with that, uh, now we're going to get into more details, uh, starting with Shannon talking about how fiscal internal controls support CCDF administration. Shannon? 
Thanks, Mike. Sorry, I had to take myself off mute. Okay, moving on to fiscal internal controls to support CCDF administration. We're going to start off with some CCDF fiscal regulations. Title 45, sections 98.67C and 9868A1 states fiscal control and accounting procedures shall be sufficient to permit preparation of reports required by the secretary under this subpart and under subpart H and the tracing of funds to a level of expenditure adequate to establish that such funds have not been used in violation of the provisions of this part and processes to ensure sound fiscal management. I like to look at these regulations as the what and the how. Sound fiscal management is more than just proper bookkeeping. It is a critical component of ensuring the sustainability, effectiveness, and efficiency of the CCDF program. It requires consistent accountability of assets, deliberate internal controls, and robust regulation compliance. As demonstrated in the continuous quality improvement graphics, this is an interconnected and iterative process that involves developing and maintaining budgets, establishing and implementing internal controls, monitoring regulatory compliance and program integrity, and repeating the process as needed to make necessary adjustments. Today's focus will be on fiscal internal control strategies and supporting practices for your consideration. Understanding accountability in the role and CCDF plan is vital to developing internal controls. This and the next slide contain a lot of information, but we wanted to highlight accountability. Section 98.11a provides the lead agency with broad authority to administer the program through other governmental and non-governmental entities. However, the lead agency retains overall responsibility for the administration of the program. Section 98.65 provides the lead agencies with the requirements for audits and financial reporting. And Section 98.68a requires lead agencies to have policies and procedures in place that ensure compliance with CCDF program requirements and to maintain continuity of care for the children and families served. Continuing on accountability in the rule in the CCDF plan, Section 98.70 provides the guidance for quarterly and annual CCDF reporting. 98.100 requires states, the District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico to calculate, prepare, and submit a report of errors occurring in the administration of CCDF grant funds, which will also provide strategies for reducing their error rates and to set target error rates for the next reporting cycle. Section 8 of your CCDF plan instructs you to describe strategies in place for risk assessment, training providers and staff, and regular evaluation of your internal control activities. A key strategy is leveraging existing data. Lead agencies should consider developing internal controls to ensure accurate financial data, as strategies and data are crucial to making informed decisions on the effectiveness of policy and process changes you are considering to make your program better. Fiscal internal controls. It is necessary to have accurate financial data and sound fiscal internal controls in place to drive operations and to measure success. Sound fiscal internal control systems can prevent and detect errors, fraud, and other issues that can deter operational efficiency and CCDF program compliance. Understanding the internal control system. A strategy is, a, is similar to a smart goal. A strategy should be specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and timely. To describe the why, what, and when. Why are we doing this? What is our approach? When do we want to achieve this? Supporting practices are the mechanisms in which a lead agency will implement to support the success of the strategy, also known as the how. Internal controls, 
ensure the effectiveness of the how in supporting the why, what, and when, and assist with measuring progress to goals. Some effective strategies can include conducting contract monitoring and budgetary expenditure reviews of contractors as well as subrecipients to ensure compliance with CCF rule, conducting annual audits and financial reviews of contractors as well as subrecipients to ensure proper fiscal controls are in place, and developing a system to ensure payments and invoices are routinely reviewed to determine whether costs are reasonable and allowable. Some lead agencies have implemented the following strategies, such as monitoring each contract area, using a developed tool that collects data on completed tasks throughout the contract year. Another example is conducting risk management assessments, assigning one of three categories, low risk, which is considered excellent history, no findings, very experienced, perhaps even a small contract amount, proven performance. Medium risk, less than excellent history, some past findings, new grantee, perhaps a large grant amount, and some unknown reasons. And high risk, poor performer, financial instability, prior findings, major staff changes, and problems identified by other monitors. Here are a few examples of fiscal internal control practices. Identifying all parties involved in the financial process, staff, providers, subcontractors, and vendors. Defining the roles and responsibilities of staff, providers, subcontractors, and vendors, such as separation of duties. Dividing fiscal responsibilities amongst staff to ensure that the staff responsible for financial reporting are separate from the staff tasked with transactional functions. Staff assigned with conducting audits should be separate from fiscal staff to ensure impartiality. We understand smaller lead agencies may not have enough staff to separate duties completely. Peer review and sign-off can serve a similar checks and balances function to mitigate and minimize risk. Establishing clear expectations via agreements, memorandums of understanding, and contracts for external parties tied to the fiscal process. Designing staff, I mean, I apologize, designating staff for required first and secondary approvals on large transactions, unexpected expenditures, and cost increases, contracts, agreements, MOUs. Developing access controls to safeguard data and protected information based on the roles and responsibilities. Proper access controls ensure the right staff have the right access and promotes organizational integrity, such as password protected areas, secure passwords and two-step authentication procedures, changing passwords frequently, enables security controls to remain effective, and developing access logs and usage history reports are automated features that can be used for routine monitoring and supporting audits. Instituting written policies and procedures, implementing the proper accounting controls is meaningless unless employees are equipped to act when they notice a problem or detect suspicious activity. Formal policies and procedures are required in order to properly equip staff for carrying out their responsibilities, as well as identifying and responding to issues as they arise. Incorporating routine monitoring, developing red flag reports, and implementing internal audits can assist in risk assessment and analysis. Identifying areas for improvement and proactively mitigate gaps in the processes. Some states have implemented the following practices, such as conducting fiscal reviews to ensure that contractors are accurately tracking and reporting their services, revenues, and expenditures, requiring contracting agencies to conduct annual independent financial and compliance audits by a certified state licensed public accountant, providing training and technical assistance to contractors to ensure contractors are informed of the state and federal laws and regulations that pertain to child development contracts. 
developing clearly defined MOUs for contractors that outlines assurances by all parties that is renewed annually and indicates all areas for which monitoring should occur as well as the dollar amount agreed upon to carry out the task, followed up by routine meetings to discuss and review CCDF project requirements and activities. So let's talk about it. But first, a reminder, a strategy in the context of this presentation is similar to a SMART goal and really talks about the why, what, and when, and the supporting practices are the mechanisms in which the lead agency will implement to support the success of the strategy, also known as the how. So what are some effective fiscal internal control strategies used in your lead agency? And please share supporting practices used in your program. We'll give you a few minutes to type, type up your responses. And just a reminder, if you put any questions in the box that we're unable to get to today, we'll definitely follow up after the webinar. So for strategies, do folks have any systems in place to carry out? Do they have like automated red flag reports that they routinely review? Okay, thank you, Christine. Christine put our operating system, Pelican, is automated. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Like what is automated in it and what does it provide you? Valentin Santiago said separation of duties, reconciliation to review transactions are allowable, valid for grants. Thank you. And how about some supporting practices? What are some practices that you have in place to support those strategies? We have Chester Stone, dual authorization of various processes. That's a good strategy. These are all great strategies, by the way. I didn't mean to single out any one person. Rebecca Banner, all of our subrecipients for contracts complete a pre-award risk assessment to determine level of risk and direct the level of program and fiscal monitoring. That's great. And so what are some of your supporting um, practices for that? Do you have routine schedules of calls? Do you have um, reports that they provide that you review and monitor that you can follow up on? Clearly developed annual contracts with monitoring. Thank you, Catherine. Karen Irwin states that they have a quality improvement report that tag irregularities and those cases are reviewed regularly. That's great, that's great. Um, Julia Anderson, we have multiple levels of payment approvals. Our finance person submits the request for payment, manager reviews and approves, and then our finance person's contract specialist also reviews and approves before payment is made. That's a great example of separation of duties. Um, let's move over to some best practices. So Catherine Smith, monthly operation reports and tools as well as year end compliance monitoring using federal tool every year. I'd love to learn more about that tool that you have. Kim Miller, our data warehouse provides high risk providers for attendance evaluation. Okay, so almost like a red flag report. And 
I'm just going to do a time check with Mike and Leanne. Um, not sure if we want to give this a few more minutes or if we want to move on to the next um, slide, next section. Paula Luan, Colorado utilizes separation of duties and risk-based reports that we monitor monthly to ensure accurate payments. We also utilize system controls, two-step authorization and security access based on user type, it's awesome, to manage worker access. We also conduct regular monitoring visits with counties to review internal controls. That's great, holding your vendors and your providers accountable with internal controls is also a very strong strategy. I think we can go ahead and let Christine finish her thought and then we'll go ahead and, oh, there we go. Go ahead and move on. She said, on. Leanne, yes. Very good. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you, Christine. And thank you everybody for participating. Um, so thank you for your time. Up next is my colleague, Mike presenting policy and process internal controls to strengthen program access and integrity. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, in this section of the webinar, I want to dig a little deeper into policy and process internal controls and discuss how they can strengthen program access and accountability. So let's start with risk assessment. Effective strategies to assess risk include analysis of improper payments and regularly reviewing job duties and staffing structure to ensure proper oversight. I know Shannon touched on that and we saw some comments in the chat uh, boxes about that as well. Um, really a, a good opportunity there to you know, just regularly review those duties and, and make sure you have the right people doing the right job and that there's no duplication like we talked about. Now, the other thing I want to do is just make a little pitch for the self-assessment instrument. The Grantee Internal Control Self-Assessment Instrument is a tool that's designed to assist agencies in assessing how well your policies and procedures align with CCDF regulatory requirements in the areas of program integrity and financial accountability. Uh, we're going to give you a little more info on this tool a little later in our presentation. Now, here are a few examples of risk assessment strategies that are utilized by other states and territories now that we just wanted to share with you today. Again, as we just talked about, it's always a good idea to separate child care payment functions if you can. Random case reviews can be really effective, even if it's with a small sample. Just gives you a, a good, uh, quick idea of, of the areas that you might want to focus on for program improvement. And finally, um, some agencies indicated to us that they just meet regularly as a group to dis discuss the results of case reviews or audits. And then they use those results to inform their policy and process changes going forward. Training staff and providers about policy and process changes always helps with your program integrity efforts. The more folks know, the less likely they are to make mistakes. And making program requirements available online is an excellent way to make sure everyone gets the same message. Again, here's some training strategies some lead agencies have employed uh, that we wanted to make you aware of. Monthly staff meetings, again, just to get consistency in terms of uh, hearing uh, what's going on with your agency and any new information that needs to be shared. Uh, developing training based on the results of audits and case reviews. We touched on that just a minute ago, but again, that can be really important. You, you, ha you have to do that work anyway, so use that information to inform how you improve your program. 
And then uh, finally, uh, routine orientation sessions uh, for providers, which can be done virtually or in person, depending on the requirements that you have in place. Regular evaluation of your internal controls is really a key to successful administration of the CCDF. As you can see from the past year, change is inevitable. So by always looking for ways to improve accountability, you're assuring that the right benefits are going to the right people. You can do that by using automated checks or red flag reports in your eligibility systems, regularly reviewing your protocols and procedures, and we would recommend at least an annual review of the sources of your improper payments. If you're seeing something consistently come up, you might want to think about a policy or process to address that. Now, you don't have to have the state-of-the-art system to support internal controls. That, that is nice, and it does help, but you can't always uh, prioritize that. So some lead agencies simply generate exception reports in Microsoft Excel and then cross-check and validate payment amounts. It's lower tech, but it's still effective. More robust systems allow you to identify errors prior to the payment going out, which is, of course, what we would always like. You can receive warnings about authorization of excess hours, uh, maybe prevent the overlap of plans for the same child at the same time. There's, there's lots of ways to, to let the system work for you. Let's look at some interesting options for red flag reports. Remember, you can create reports to help you manage providers, families, and staff. So, for instance, a new and inactive provider report details providers new to the system and providers no longer participating so that appropriate actions can be taken with the children enrolled or seeking to enroll with the provider. A payment threshold report is a report that flags certain providers whose payments exceed anticipated billings. And then further review of the billing practice is initiated based on these reports. A duplicate payment report identifies payments that may have been issued to a provider on behalf of the same child more than once in a service month. Under certain situations, eligibility workers are allowed to override results in your eligibility and or payment systems. An eligibility override report can flag these overrides, and then you can set it to require a, re a review above a certain threshold if you want to. And then the underutilization report. Now, this indicates children who are not attending at the authorized level, and then contact can be made to determine if services are still needed, or maybe it's just a change in the level of services that's warranted. Finally, a duplicate SSN report can identify children who are included in two separate active cases at the same time. So lots of options here. I'm sure there are lots of other reports that agencies utilize, uh, but we just want to make you, you aware of a few that uh, we thought were interesting. And uh, if you ever want more information on any reports, again, feel free to reach out to the regional office. All right, so I'm going to wrap up my presentation on, on this section with a few questions for you. Again, you can provide your response in the chat box. Um, you can ask questions, too. Uh, if we don't get to your question today, I uh, just want you to know we are able to save the content from these chats, so we will get back to you, even if we don't do it today. So um, if you can, 
tell us what red flag reports are used in your program or you know maybe a few that you find really useful we're also interested in any provider or stra uh, staff training strategies that you use that maybe I haven't mentioned that you think other agencies may be interested in. And then finally, if you have any examples of results that you're reporting in your plan submittals for Section 8 related to program integrity, uh, we would love to hear about that. So, you know, if you've got uh, if you measure the number invest of investigations you do or uh, collections or how you establish claims, anything related to results uh, that are program integrity related, we would love to hear about that too. So we're going to give you a few minutes and, and see what we get here. So Kim Miller uh, mentioned an all-present and all-absent report to flag high-risk situations. If you have any others that you commonly use, again, automated or not automated, we'd love to hear about it. Kim gave an example of a uh, training strategy as well. Provider Compliance has a training on our website and one through the Moodle training platform. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, Leanne asked about Moodle. Anything more you can tell us about that, Kim? We're going to give you a couple more minutes here. Again, let's uh, let's see if anybody has examples of results. How many investigations do you do? How much do you collect in improper payments? Does anybody calculate any savings from the activities that they do to to support program integrity? Here's another example of a red flag report from Phil. We have a flag for delinquent claims when doing payments to providers. We also have a red flag report for duplicate payments. Thank you, Phil. And for anybody that's wondering, Moodle is a training platform available through your website, Kim, North Carolina. It includes staff, providers, and others. Rosalvo has uh, talked about an overcapacity report, a revenue growth report, temporary closure status, and suspicious payment timing. Thanks for an example of results, Kim. We see we've got we do 400 random provider evaluations for attendance billing on an annual basis. Thank you for that. We're going to give you just a couple more minutes and then uh, keep the webinar rolling here. A couple people typing, so I'm just going to give them a, a second here. Kim Miller again says, I really like the idea of a payment threshold report. We can implement that in North Carolina. So if anybody's got that and any information they can share, let North Carolina know.
And Resolvo is indicated as far as training that they have provider program integrity training. CBT and PDF training overview on violations and then technical assistance to maintain compliance. That's great. All right, folks, thank you so much for the feedback. Uh, I hope all the participants were able to see these, uh, these responses, some great ideas for you to take back and consider for your agency. Always glad to help you out with technical assistance. Uh, you just need to reach out to the regional office and let us know. So thanks again for your support of program integrity. Uh, next in our webinar, Jen, Janae Broadway is going to talk to you briefly about some tools available to you to support internal controls and program integrity. Janae? Thanks, Mike. All right. So as Mike stated, my name is Janae Broadway. And before I introduce our, our guest presenter from Georgia. We wanted to share, like Mike stated, a few resources that are available to help assist CCDF lead agencies in assessing their internal controls. So starting with the CCDF Fraud Toolkit. So this resource uh, was designed to assist CCDF lead agencies in increasing program integrity and accountability and decreasing fraud within their child care program. The toolkit encompasses five separate evaluation sections. Those include fraud risk, prevention, detection, enforcement and recovery, and monitoring assessment. Now, as an FYI, the monitoring section may prove to be useful in assessing internal controls and accountability mechanisms as you all are administering all the new funding streams. If you'd like assistance in completing the assessment or any of the assessments outside of the monitoring, please reach out to your regional office. Or maybe you've completed the assessment and need assistance mitigating some of those potential risk areas. We are here to help and can assist with strategy or peer-to-peer -peer session. So let's talk a little bit more about the toolkit. So here we have a snapshot of the toolkit. You'll see that each assessment is divided into categories. The categories are selected based on established risk areas in CCDF administration. Each category has questions that are based on federal regulatory compliance or general CCDF program integrity, accountability, or fraud areas. Once all questions, once all questions are answered in the tool, the tool will auto-populate risk indicators from low to high for the questions in the category. Now, we are currently redesigning the toolkit to be available online in an e-learning format that will include links to more resources to help, for, help with fraud prevention, detection, monitoring, enforcement, and recovery. But for now, you guys are welcome and encouraged to reach out to us directly using the email provided on the previous screen or to your regional office for one or all of the assessment sections. And let's talk here about a few benefits of using the toolkit. So the toolkit itself allows for the agency to conduct the self-evaluation of their internal controls and other program integrity strategies. The tool highlights the CCDF regulatory program integrity requirements while providing fraud fighting, integrity, and accountability strategies. And lastly here, you'll see that the tool when utilized gives the agency an ability to mitigate potential gaps or risks in their subsidy administration prior to monitoring or performance audit. Now let's look at the grantees internal control self-assessment, also known as the SAI. So this particular tool can be used by state or federal managers 
to evaluate how well a grantee's internal controls are functioning, determining if or determine if changes are needed, and what, where, and how those improvements can be made. Completing this instrument in part or in whole enables grantees to reflect on ways they can improve their program integrity practices. Now, this, this instrument, while it may look different from the March 2019 version because we have updated it, the content has not changed in the updated interactive version of the instrument. The instrument now also includes an addendum. The addendum supports the grantees in completing the instrument by providing the applicable uh, CCDF regulation and any administrative guidance for each section. And we also have a similar tool that was developed for tribal lead agencies called the Tribal Lead Agency Fiscal Risk Assessment. The tribal tool can be used by tribal lead agency administrators fiscal staff, management officials, and any other TLA or tribal lead agency leader to review how well their policies and procedures meet the CCDF requirements in the areas of program integrity and fiscal accountability. In addition, the tribal worksheet can also be used by tribal lead agencies as part of their fiscal management training or at any time to assess how well their internal controls are working to determine, again, what, where, and how improvements can be made. So those are just a couple of resources that we have available. Uh, I do want to share two briefs that can also assist you with your internal control processes, and those briefs are the uh, program integrity, program integrity data, shine, data mining, sharing, and analytics brief. Uh, this brief was developed to assist CCDF lead agencies in understanding the benefits of utilizing administrative data they already possess. There are detailed examples in the brief related to uh, the, that administrative data and how to utilize it. And it also provides the benefits of data sharing in CCDF. And next, there's the sample interagency data sharing MOU. Now, this tool provides some general considerations for agencies when developing those internal interagency household, household, verifi household eligibility verification agreements. And that's between two separate government agencies. Now, while the sample is geared toward household eligibility verification, the tool itself outlines some of the specific items in related to section the the CCDF uh, 45 CFR 9811. And of course, these briefs can be downloaded. I think there was an issue with downloading the MOU, but they're definitely available online. And we, it looks like, yep, we've shared that link in the chat box for you guys as, as well. So the self-assessment, the toolkit, the data sharing, data mining, sharing, and analytics, the TLA, they're all available online and available for download in the pod box. All right. So before I, like I say, before I introduce our wonderful uh, presenter from Georgia, we'd like to get a little bit more feedback from you guys. So as we continue to develop resources and tools for CCDF agencies, we want to make sure that we're meeting your needs, right? And it looks like you guys are already putting in answers, and that's great. So that was actually the next one. So in the first box, um, please advise in the chat box how we can improve on the tools, or if you guys have any specific uh, topics or resources that you guys would like for us to touch on or develop. So you can do that in the tools and tips, the first chat box. And the next uh, two pods, there, there are a couple of questions, right? Is, has your agency used a fraud toolkit? And has your agency used a self-assessment instrument? So of course, you can just reply yes, no, or if you're unsure, you'll, you'll mark unsure. But we definitely would like to get feedback on tools that you guys would like to see or topics you would like to uh, have us present on or bring in other state presenters to speak to. 
and we'll give you a couple of minutes to uh, respond. All right, so I see that there, there are a lot of unsure about the essay, the self-assessment and the fraud toolkit. And I'll ask a question that you guys can type in the toolbox, uh, the tools and tips. For those that are unsure, do you have you guys heard of either of the toolkit prior to today's call, the toolkit or the instrument? Yes? Okay, great. Okay. And how about have you have you I've never heard of the Fry Toolkit. Okay, so this is a great opportunity for you guys to reach out to the regional office to see how uh, you, your agency could benefit from the toolkit or the self-assessment. But for those who have heard of it and are unsure or have not used it, uh, would you, is there anything that we can do differently to make that tool be more beneficial for your organization, your agency? Or would you guys like for us to kind of go through the tools in a little bit more in depth on another webinar? Maybe it's just you just need a little bit more information and need to see the functionality of the tools. Yep, Kim Miller, Kim, Kim Miller says, yep, let's do a session just like the one you're describing. For the future. Sounds good. Awesome. I'll give it a few more minutes. A few of you guys are still typing. Good deal. So I'll let you guys finish typing up. It looks like we have a few more people. But while you're typing, I want to thank you all for providing that information. And uh, I time to get to where you got while you guys are here, right? So without further ado, I would like to present our state presenter, Mr. Woody Dover, the Enterprise Project Management Director at Georgia Department of Early Care and Learning, who will discuss Georgia's awesome stable project. Mr. Woody. Dover, the floor is yours. Hey, good afternoon. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Woody Dover. I am the Enterprise Project Management Director with the Georgia Department of Early Care and Learning. Um, we are the lead agency for the state of Georgia uh, for CCDF. And um, fortunately for us, uh, all CCDF activities fall within our purview. So we able, we're able to manage all areas of CCDF without having to um, get input from our legislature or uh, other state agencies, and that does prove to be very efficient. Um, and today I want to go over um, our stabilization response to uh, COVID-19 pandemic um, that we've run for the last year and plan to um, continue with the new funding that's been made available through the American Rescue Plan. So uh, when the pandemic hit. Um, clearly, the first response from the federal government for funding was the CARES Act, um, and that was passed, I believe, on March 27th of 2020. And right away, um, you know, Georgia, we began planning on stabilization payments um, and trying to figure out a way to expedite those payments to the correct entities uh, in Georgia to clearly stabilize child care. Um, just um, one thing to note about what happened in Georgia is that child care was uh, never closed like it was in many states. Um, however, uh, group sizes were restricted, um, and clearly, uh, you know, there, the attendance was dramatically reduced because of, you know, the pandemic. So when CARE, the CARES Act was passed, we knew we uh, needed to act very quickly to uh, get the funding out to those providers. 
Um, but clearly, uh, you know, it, when you see that much money and you know you got to get out the door fast, it, it, it can be a little bit nerve-wracking to, to think how you do so in a way that's responsible. So I think it was really important that we establish not only an efficient process for distributing the funds, but also a process that really fit within our current internal controls framework and processes to maintain the legal and fiscal integrity that, that, that needs to be there. So we call this program our, our stable project, our stable program. Um, and, and so in Georgia, we like our acronyms. So I think pretty much everything we do now is an acronym, but the acronym here is stable for the, the short-term assistance benefit for licensed entities. And it was made available to all licensed child care providers in Georgia. Um, the initial application um, rolled out in May of 2020. Um, since May of 2020 through, uh, through today, uh, we've distributed a little over $165 million um, in three different funding rounds. Let's see. So, uh, so like I said, the first, the first round rolled out May 1. Uh, we uh, had an application that was online. Uh, we It was open for two weeks. Um, we had a really high response rate uh, right away, so roughly 37, you know, 3,800 providers uh, applied. Uh, the total amount of the payments came to $38.5 million. Um, and, and we based the payments on uh, providers had to give us their pre-pandemic attendance and their operating status, so whether they were open or temporarily closed, because that did have a determination on the amount of funding they had made that was made available. Um, and we were able to, um, within 30 days of the close of the application, we were able to distribute 92% of the funds. And the second round occurred in December of 2020. Um, it was a, a larger payment, clearly. Um, yeah, we actually had fewer respondents this time, um, just under 3,700. Um, you know, it was actually based on October 2020, 2020 attendance. So, you know, this helped us kind of, A, measure the difference in attendance pre-pandemic to October 2020. But then we actually, um, and what we realized is with the data that we gathered the application, that um, program attendance on average had dropped 25 percent. Um, obviously, that could have been drastically different for individual providers, but on average, it was 25 percent. So we did um, increase all payments, uh, calculated payments by 25 percent, uh, which was ended up being a sizable increase in the total payments out the door. We also uh, paid everybody at a single rate. Uh, the first round was a, a higher rate for being open uh, and a low, slightly lower rate for being closed. And we also prorated across programs like our Georgia Pre-K program, our child care subsidy program. So if you, because um, you were already receiving funding through those programs, so we were kind of, you know, were adding to those programs. But if there was a program that was not receiving any other um, public benefit, then they were getting the, the fullest amount of, of, that, of, that, of the per child rate. Uh, we did get, and with that program, we got 98% of the funding out with the door within 30 days of the close of that application. And finally, we had our third round just this spring um, in April of 2021, uh, and it was our largest round of payments at $72.7 million. It was deemed, uh, we had more recipients uh, this time, uh, 30, over 3,800. Um, and uh, it was based on, uh, rather than actually collect attendance this time, we, uh, we used prior data to calculate uh, a payment based on their capacity and what their attendance would typically look like relative to capacity because we needed to collect some other data for them. Um, the funding, you know, the, the, we had really gotten much better at uh, paying providers through this process, so we had roughly 99% of the money out the door within 30 days uh, of the close of that application. So um, that's just a summary of the, of the three rounds and the total funding thus far. Uh, I think it was important, like I said, uh, you know, with, with, with by the point of the second round, we had already received CARES funding as well as the CURSA money. Uh, there was a lot of money out there to, to push out the door to providers and to try to do so efficiently and quickly. Um, but like I said, it, it makes me nervous. You know, how do you do so in a responsible way that, that really um, allows you to um, you know, be accountable? Um, so, you know, we, so to serve both ends, I mean, you know, we, we leverage our existing resources where possible. We, you know, we try not to, you know, reinvent the wheel, um, but actually use our existing um, technology and processes. Um, 
our internal control framework and process that we already had in place to really um, you know, not only do it push things up the door quickly, but do so in a way that we're, that had the right level of accountability so that you know we could hold providers responsible in the case of fraud, we could provide um, proper fraud analysis, um, those types of things. So, uh, and then the existing resources that helped us to do that is that by focusing on licensed child care providers and their child care agreements that we have in place that are renewed annually. Uh, we had a child care cost model that we used to help us um, estimate the amount of money to make available or to pay per child. Uh, we also um, used our child care um, provider self-service web portal for the application. Um, this way that the, this, you know, the provider is, you know, has a secure place they can log in, they can, we can create an application and then they can submit it. Uh, it's just much more efficient, but also gives us more or less a, a quick and um, quick way of collecting the information, validating it, giving the provider a copy of it, um, those types of things. Um, we also used our current child care subsidy payment vendor to, to make the payment, A, because they're familiar with our processes and, um, and, and can do so much more efficiently than, than we could by trying to do something we don't normally do, which is pay providers. And also, it fit within our uh, just our current program integrity controls, uh, and that's uh, like relative to you know auditing and making sure that it um, you know was was set up so that it, it it could be the data could be analyzed and properly evaluated by our auditing team internally. So more specifically around uh, the child care licensing agreements um, in Georgia, when you were licensed, you are uh, because of the rules and regulations around licensing, you are, you are a CCDL eligible provider. You meet all the requirements of being a CCDL eligible provider. So um, really focusing on those providers and making them the, not only do they serve, you know, they are the, the backbone of our child care industry, uh, we already know that they meet the requirements for CCDF. So by focusing the payments to them, um, it, 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 it's a clear and established path to ensure that, the, that those receiving the funding are eligible to do so. Um, also, um, it, you know, that process of ha being licensed, maintaining your license, paying your license fee annually, providers are also completing the process to receive a public benefit. So uh, once again, you know, in state, state and federal laws, you know, there are certain things that have to be done to, to receive a public benefit, and, and, and these providers have already completed that process every year. So, at, so if they were eligible and li they were licensed at the time of the application, they had completed all the steps to A, B, C, C, D, F eligible, but also to receive a, a public benefit. And so what we did is we, we made our stable payments, which we call them, um, a benefit of having that license. Um, doing so meant that we could leverage the existing agreement and the um, controls around that as well as um, it, it meant that we didn't have to create new agreements. They could essentially um, accept the terms of this payment. So we could add additional terms to it because some, some of these providers are used to, to um, being paid, but many have not been paid by um, the state before. So, but they could, we could put new terms on these payments um, and they could accept those and then we could hold them accountable to those terms. All right, and so and then one of the other, um, existing resources I mentioned was our child care cost model. Uh, we, we used uh, our cost model to really to develop a single rate. So we wanted to make it as simple as possible. So a single rate to account for the per child cost for the vast majority of providers. Um, in Georgia, we have a QRIS, it's a three-star QRIS system, so one, two, three stars. Um, the largest number of child care providers in Georgia are two-star rated, so uh, we took the per child cost model rate of, uh, for the or a quality rated two star provider in metro atlanta to to be our rate for this project um, and the thinking behind that is that for the vast majority of providers out there it would account for their cost or exceed their cost we also put in place uh, it allowed us to put in place variation for at least for the initial round um, for being open or temporarily closed meaning that the funding was relative to either um, a provider being open and operating at typical um, capacity or being temporarily closed. So therefore your funding 
the essentially the fixed cost of being temporarily closed, but not the cost that that's no longer there once you're once you're not operating like food or something like that. But our cost model allowed us to model those types of situations and pay appropriately. We also, like I mentioned earlier, um, we it allows to um, prorate based on other funding streams. So, you know, you could ask the. Uh, we also we didn't want to providers who were Head Start funded, who were also licensed to to get funding for the same thing. So if this, you know they if they were if they had children in attendance that were you know on their Head Start rosters or early Head Start rosters, they had to tell us that, um, and then they would receive they didn't receive any payment for those children. Um, if since we were had put in place payment policies that had been amended for COVID, we were allowing providers to receive subsidy payments even when children were absent. So what we did is we prorated uh, so for these children. So if uh, they had a child that was where they were receiving their full subsidy rate, uh, we paid two thirds. I'm sorry, 50% of, of of the typical rate. And then in, uh, we also have a, uh, a pre-K program in Georgia. That's a universal pre-K program, um, and 50% of the pre-K slots in Georgia were at, ch at private childcare. And we were continuing to fully fund those programs. So we, um, for those four and five-year-olds in the pre-K program, we funded one third of the full rate to, as a as a means of essentially funding like after school for every child in their pre-K. All right. Um, the next uh, the next resource that we, we we decided to really try to leverage to the fullest extent um, was our child care provider self service portal. Um, so in Georgia, um, all licensed and license exempt providers have a a, a, their, a login for their program um, to to manage their account. They can use this to manage what the public can see when they search for child care. They can also use this uh, portal to initiate processes around updating their license or to get resources. Um, and we're continually improving that, that, that portal to, um, you know, to use less paper to move more online processes because it, it allows you to more efficiently um, track, um, monitor, store information related to child care licensing and processes related there. Um, so you know, using, you know, it seemed like a no-brainer to use that. Um, because we could create an online port, an application that sat within each individual provider's login uh, screen. So they would log in, um, they would hit, hit apply, and once they went through the application, they would, um, so what they would do is they fill out, like I said, they, we did an attendance grid. So for the first two rounds, um, the you know, the first round was supposed to be pre-pandemic. Um, the second round was more or less mid-pandemic, so October 2020. But what we had them do was use their attendance um, sheets that they have on, on file, and then ask them to enter their total attendance. So what we did is, you know, we said, okay, for February 2020, tell us every child that attended your program at least one time in the month of February, and so they would do that by age. And tell us of those of those to, of the total number of children, you know, how many were Head Start or early Head Start or so on those rosters. And as I mentioned earlier, there was no funding for those because we don't want to duplicate funding. Um, and then we prorated for we our CAPS or QRSG attendance in that middle column, but that's our subsidy program. Uh, we actually had at the time we had um, our typical scholarship program. We also had a contract program, um, but they had that attendance there. Um, and then we have our Georgia Pre-K attendance. And then what the, it would do is calculate a private attendance based on how they answered it. And, and then they would tabulate a payment based on the payment factors that were involved and the proration factors. And the next, um, the next part of the application was they gave us a budget. So we, we gave them a set number of categories for which, you know, they could use the funding for. Um, and we put rules around, you know, how they could, you know, they, we said that they could, um, so this had to equal 100 percent of their um, of their payment. So it just you know, but they could they could set up for what worked for them and their situation. Um, and we gave them you know guidance throughout that was associated with the application that told them you know in general the types of costs that kind of make up these areas, but also try to maintain flexibility. So if they had questions, we could give them more specific answers, uh, either through, through customer service you know calls or through emails. Um, but the idea here was that they give us a budget. We want them to stick to that budget. So we gave them a, a start date. So um, 
they had a time, a start date and an end date for each round that they had to, you know, they could apply costs backwards, so costs incurred to some degree, uh, and then moving forward an end date. Um, and then when they used the funds, the the rules were that they could do so. Um, they had they could they could only their real costs or the actual costs could vary by 10% in any in, in in a category. So if they if their costs if they increased their costs relative to the budget by 10% in one category, they had to actually offset it in another category. Um, and and they're advised they have to you know whether they're when they're in attendance and when they're entering um, their budget and then tr you know tracking how they're using the dollars you know the expectation was set through the this 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 uh, each round and each application that they had to be able to, to to prove you know a the attendance and that that was used to justify their payment but also b they had to track how they used the funds and be able to account for that in the event of an audit. But the great thing about the on, making this an online application is that you could collect, you know, thousands of applications very fast. You could uh, test that application process to ensure that it's calculating things correctly um, and it amounts correctly. You could, um, you know, once they hit us, they hit submit. They got they got a confirmation of our receipt, and then they also got an email to summarize what they entered. So they didn't have to keep track of that stuff. We gave it back to them and said, "Here's what you submitted." Um, and then here's what you're going to be held accountable to. Um, and in that process, they had to accept the terms of, of, of the benefit as well. Uh, and then the next, and the next uh, item that really was existing that we also leveraged that helped us to, to maintain accountability um, and also expedite the process was we used our current child, child care subsidy payment vendor to, to execute our payments. Um, the one main reason is because they're, they're, provi they're eligible providers were already in their system. They already had profiles set up. 65% um, of those providers that had profiles set up um, were already receiving payments through that through that process, um, and so we had an established process for setting up new payees. So um, in Georgia, we've um, we really try to, to you know we make sure that you know, basically when you receive a public benefit, we have to make sure that and in, in, in the case of you know this stable, it, it's the the license enable and entitles you to the benefit. So we've got to make sure that the owner of the license is the, indeed the one entity or person that's actually receiving the deposit. And so this vendor, because those, those more or less those same rules apply um, to our subsidy program, um, this, this, provider was, this vendor was already prepared to, to leverage existing processes for payment verification. So, um, you know, we, and what we do there is we get, um, you know, we get the W-9 and we get a direct deposit. Uh, form and we make sure that you know we, we do a, a 10 check with the IRS to ensure that the the, the tax ID matches the owner of the license and then we make sure that the um, the the direct deposit provides an account that is then also owned by the owner of the license so once again these are processes are already in place and so we can leverage those because we're comfortable with them and we know that they're they have the right degree of accountability and, and and then so what we're able to do is that that vendor was able to make payments up to $10 million a day. So that, that was able, that enabled us to, you know, get people set up accurately, make sure they're, they're set up appropriately to receive payments if need, if need be, but then also expedite the payments out the door so that within 30 days we were able to get, you know, as you see, like 90 to almost 100% of payments out the door in 30 days. And then just uh, as I mentioned, you know, so just leverage existing program integrity controls. So like, like I mentioned, um, you know, through the application, we put in place um, requirements or additional um, um, requirements of the payment. So um, they had to, providers had to um, acknowledge and agree to the rules of the program that were in addition to, you know, what's on their license. So they had to maintain their license and be in compliance with their license. But they also must use, you know, the funds in accordance with the budget that they've given to us. And then they must obviously, you know, rank, retain all their records and allow access in the event of an audit. Um, this way, once again, that, you know, it just leverages existing processes that allowed us to uh, quickly, um, you know, you know, allow us to tell them, you know, what their responsibilities were um, and allowed us to um, quickly um, process all the applications, ensure that they were calculated appropriately, have a record of the information that justified the amount, then um, also the um, the payment process from our vendor 
ensures that it's double checked through our typical um, subsidy reconciliation process where we actually you know take what the what the vendor has given us we get um, all scholarships and grant payments by vendor um, to verified to make sure that it adds up correctly and then it also allows us to um, to apply the correct fund sources to to the benefit so I mean clearly in the event of uh, you know, CURSA or CARES were, you know, CCDF-based fund sources, but we needed to track and see, you know, you know, apply them correctly to CARES or CURSA funds based on the usage and the payments. And then moving forward, um, you know, looking forward to the new stabilization program, um, I do see, while we're still in the planning phases of that, um, I do see us, you know, taking stable and modifying it to, to adhere to the new requirements. Um, and, and then checks and balances are, they're required through that. Um, you know, I think what we'll do is do multiple payments. So we'll have to figure out, you know, uh, I think we have the right um, structure in place to do, you know, multiple payments over many months, uh, but also making sure that we, if we need to tweak or uh, create new accountability measures that we will. And then we're also intended to kind of use, you know, possible enhancements to uh, whether if the providers, you know, want to main, you know, offer you know, or, or guarantee a minimum salary for their child care staff, then we would find that. This is some of the things we're thinking about. So that's it. So I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. Thank you, Woody. Uh, great presentation. And uh, you guys did an amazing job of getting a lot of money out to a lot of providers in a short amount of time. Um, while leveraging those uh, existing internal controls. Very impressive, and I think uh, STABLE is an apt acronym for the project, so thanks again. Um, like Woody said, if you got any questions, we'd, we would uh, love to see if we've got time to answer them. We've got a few minutes, so if you have any questions for Woody, uh, put them in the chat box, and if we've got time, we will respond to them, and if we don't, uh, we'll get back to you. Okay, so Woody, I don't know if you see it, but Christine Smith asks, how do you reach those who are not utilizing the portal? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question because um, honestly I know there are, we know there are providers that potentially do not. I mean, in Georgia you are required to use that portal. Now, um, now if we and most do clearly because we've seen that. I think um, over the course of these programs, we had nine of, of the currently open providers. Ninety-two percent of them applied for at least one round of stable. But we do know that there are essentially our providers who are, have difficulty using it. I think we're going to have to we're going to make probably an exception to that um, when it comes to future use. Um, I think it's clear that some providers it may have been a challenge. We did. Um, um, I do know talking to providers. You know, in very specific instances uh, where they were able to, if they had trouble using it, um, they were able to, to to get someone to help them use it. And I'm thinking very most likely for family home providers in Georgia. I don't think any of our center-based providers had any big issues using it, but family home providers um, did have issues uh, where people who just aren't used to the technology and don't normally use it had uh, so whether it was just me being on the phone with them, walking them through it, or um, they got somebody else. I mean, the way we set this up, though, is it it didn't really require you know any additional people or resources really on our side. I mean, we we use existing staff, existing technology staff, um, and then I mean, pretty much you know I did all the customer service for the most part, but um, that was really it. I mean, it, unfortunately, you can't. Unfortunately, you know, it, I, I think that by making an online self service portal application, some providers will have a hard time or may not use it because they don't want the, the technology is not there, but I understand talking to, um, you know, OCC staff that that might, you know, need to be addressed. But, um, you know, it, it just it came down to just efficiency and, and accountability that, that we just felt we had to, to use it. Great. And Thanks, Woody. Yeah. Um, Anne wonders uh, if you randomly audit any of the payments made to the centers. Yeah, we have not randomly audited yet. I mean, but what the good thing is in Georgia, and I'm sure uh, some may on this, on this call know, in Georgia we actually have a, a, a risk management um, 
system. So it's an automated risk management system that our, our auditing staff um, can establish red flags and we um, load payment details, uh, um, case details, things like that into that system. So we kind of already know who, who are our riskiest providers. So it would, so when we begin auditing these, I mean, I, I, I'd imagine we could go ahead and find providers, because since all our childcare providers, we can see which ones already have red flags through other programs, and we can just export all the data to our, our, our auditing staff in order to then begin that process. So no, we have not yet, but it's a, it's a fairly simple way to start that. Great. Uh, we're gonna, I'm just going to pose this last question from Rob, and I think you kind of answered part of it before because Robin asked if everyone used the portal. But the other part of this was if, if not, what's the percentage of those providers using uh, the portal versus not, if you know that? Does that make sense, Woody? Did we lose Woody? Woody's typing, folks, so just stay tuned here. I think we might have an audio issue. Um, yeah, he says he's still connected, but you cannot hear me. So given the time constraints, again, uh, Robin, uh, we'll get back to you with your, the answer to your question uh, and yours as well, Shannon. But again, for the sake of timing, I want to just uh, wrap this piece up. I want to thank Woody for a great presentation today. And we've got just a couple of minutes for any other questions or open discussion. If you have anything else you want to share with the group or any questions you want to pose, if we can uh, answer them, we will. One question that we had that maybe folks can answer is we wonder if anyone has developed red flag reports for those instances where your payment is based on enrollment. So if anybody has developed any red flags report based uh, for that those situations where payment is based on enrollment, we'd love to to hear about that or any other questions you have or comments. Thanks for your comment, Robin. Appreciate it. Glad you enjoyed the session. All right, uh, seeing no further questions at this point, uh, we appreciate the, the comments. Uh, Phil Zell is typing something. Okay, thank you. So uh, we're going to wrap this up. Shannon, I'm going to turn it back over to you to wrap things up for us today. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mike. Yes, lots of great information today, and we hope you found today's presentation helpful. Um, just a few reminders, a friendly reminder to build out your new CCDS plan to include more information about your internal controls. Um, we ask that you please complete the evaluation at the end of this webinar to help us tailor future webinars based on your needs. And always remember we are here to assist you. Remember technical assistance is available upon request through your regional office. And last but not least, our next Program Integrity Webinar is scheduled for September 14th, 2021. Stay tuned for further details. Um, and I lied. One last thing. Be sure that you download all the resources that were provided in the resource pod for your um, ease of use. Um, and with that, we'd like to close with a huge thank you to all of you for taking the time to join us today and wish everyone a safe and happy summer. Thank you. <laughs>